Welcome to Electron Line. Now let's start talking about the habitable zone in a solar system. And yes, we said a solar system, not our solar system, because we want to be more general. Before we get into all the specific things that you want to find in a particular solar system, let's look at the various stars of different types of solar systems. For example, yes, we live near a G-type star, a G2 star, and it's an ideal star for a good, nice, habitable zone where we happen to live within. But what about a planet, an Earth-like planet, around a very small M-type star? Or what about a planet near an F-type star? Would those also be good places where we can look for the habitable zone, the place where life would be possible or more likely to exist? Now, when we talk about the habitable zone in a solar system, well, we really are talking about where life can really exist and where it cannot exist. Not necessarily a higher opportunity or chance for the existing, because let's say you're 20, 30, 40 astronomical units away from our sun, the temperatures are so frigid there that it's so unlikely that life can actually exist, that life can survive in those horrendous conditions, that you probably wouldn't be looking for life on a planet that would be that far out from a G-type star. So we really are looking for a place where it's warm enough where water could be in a liquid form and where it's not too warm, where things could just get horrendously hot, like on Venus, for example. So we are looking for a range where life is simply possible because of the conditions are good enough for life to exist and not horrendously hot or brutally cold on either side of that, that window. So you can see that the habitable uh, zone or the habitable, yeah, the zone for a uh, a star like the Sun would be about from about one astronomical unit to about 1.68 astronomical units. I'm not quite sure how they calculated that, but they do admit that the range could be greater because those are really very confined areas. And notice our Earth would be just inside the habitable zone according to this model that they came up with. They do admit that it could be as close as Venus, for example, even though Venus is not a good place for life. Maybe if things would have been different, maybe if the size of the planet was different, was a different atmospheric content, there were different uh, situations, you could potentially have a planet there that could have life even closer than 0.9 astronomical units. And you can see that Mars is right at the very edge of the outside of the band, and presumably Mars had conditions at the early part of its existence where life could have existed, if Mars had been a bigger planet, so it could have hung on to its atmosphere, maybe, perhaps, today, there could be life, or if nothing else, there could be an environment where we actually tr could travel there and we could take off our spacesuits and breathe the air and, and live without any special uh, equipment. So, yes, this is about the range where Earth and Mars are right in between, and that is what we would call the habitable zone for a place where we have a star like our Sun. But what would it be like if we had a planet nearby, a tiny little red star, or what if we had a, uh, a planet nearby a bigger F star. Well, there are some problems with either one. So let's take a look at the smaller star because after all, these are the most common stars in the universe. So if life is possible near a star like that, there would be a lot more opportunities. So these stars are fairly small. They don't put out a lot of radiation. So the habitable zone is actually very close to the star itself. It turns out that the inner radius and the outer radius of the habitable zone range for about a quarter the distance to Mercury to half the distance to Mercury. So that's, first of all, a very narrow band, and it's very close to the star. There's a big problem with that. Take a look at Mercury. Mercury is tightly locked with the Sun. In other words, it, the rotation on the, of the planet on its axis and the time that it takes to go around the Sun ones is tightly locked in a 3 to 2 ratio. Now, in the case of Mercury, it's 3 to 2. That's because Mercury has a very elliptical orbit. If Mercury had a more circular orbit, then the, the tidal lock would be 1 to 1, which means, just like with the Moon and the Earth, the same side of the planet would always face the Sun, which means one side would be very warm and the other side would be very, very cold. Not a good place for life to exist. So, the tidal lock would be a problem for a planet to be close to a, a red star like that. Secondly, these red stars, even though they're so small, they're not as quite 
and normal as a G-type star. But in other words, there's a lot of internal commotion with the magnetic field, and there's always a lot of frequent outbursts, which could potentially damage life on a planet nearby. There would be a lot of solar outbursts, a lot of material being shot out, a lot of radiation shot out, and it would be harmful to life that close to a star like that. And the habitable zone would be extremely small, exp extremely narrow. So it would be very plausible that if a planet has any sort of elliptical orbit, that it would wander inside and outside and inside and outside the zone, so that sometimes it would simply be too hot and other times in its orbit would simply be too cold for life to exist. So it's not a good place for these types of stars. It does have one advantage, these stars have an extremely long lifespan. They last for hundreds of billions, even trillions of years before they become red giants. Lots of time for life to be able to evolve and, and evolve into an intelligent species. But because of all the other conditions, it's simply not a, an ideal place for life to exist. As we already know, the Sun is a very good star. It's nice and stable. Its lifespan is about 10 billion years. We've only gone through about five of those billion years. Now there's discussion that the sun may only be a good place to live nearby for maybe another one, one and a half billion years. And after that, the star is going to become larger. It's going to put out more heat. It may become too hot for life to exist on Earth. Maybe Earth might turn into a Venus as the sun begins to slowly get bigger and brighter and put out more energy. But at least we got another billion years. And that is because we have a nice long 10 billion year lifespan. The conditions are ideal. The sun is a relatively quiet star. The changes, the fluctuations aren't very big. And so therefore it's an ideal situation. Now let's go to an F-type star. An F-type star is bigger than the sun and it doesn't have as long of a lifespan. Only two to four billion years. Now notice, since it took us four and a half billion years for people to come and, and live on the surface of the earth, if we had lived near a planet that only has a lifespan of two to four billion years, we wouldn't have come about because we wouldn't have had enough time. Now that doesn't mean that life can't evolve and become intelligent in less time, it just compared to the earth, it just wasn't enough time. So there may be a time crunch because of that. A second part of it is that these types of stars produce a whole lot more UV radiation and UV radiation is very harmful to life. Now, luckily, the Earth has an ozone layer to protect us from the limited amount of UV radiation from the sun, but a star like this would put out many times as much of the radiation, much of the high energy radiation, and therefore, without an ozone layer, and if the ozone layer isn't present, life simply wouldn't be able to exist. Do notice that the distance where it would be ideal to live nearby a star like that would have to be farther away, somewhere about two to four astronomical units. Otherwise, it would be too hot close by and it would still be too cold farther away than that. So it does seem that G-type stars are the most ideal type of star. Anything bigger than that, the lifespans are too short. Smaller than that, you get into a situation where you have to be so close that it's just probably not a good place for planets to exist in order to have a long, sustained, calm period where life can slowly evolve. So that gives us an idea where we want to be looking for probably G-type stars and planets nearby. And that is how it's done. So all the F, G, and M, those are from the HR diagrams, right? So the, yes, the F, G, and M, those are the, the spectral types of the various stars from the HR diagram. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so the bigger the star, the older they are? The bigger the star, the older they are, it's actually the other way around. The smaller the star, the longer they live before they become red giants. So when we look at M-type stars, we see many of them. That's because all of the ones that have formed since the beginning of the universe are still M-type stars. They'll be there for hundreds of billions of years and never change. Larger stars have come and gone over the many billions of years, so they don't last as long. So when they're born, they were born big. When stars are born, they are born into the size that they are, depending upon how much mass they're able to accumulate from the cloud that were formed. So it's a one-time thing. The star doesn't change its size once it's on a main sequence. But then when it becomes a red giant, it gets bigger. What happens to stars when they become red giants? Yes, they all become bigger. And if life still exists on the Earth, when our sun becomes a red giant, that'll probably be the end of all life on Earth at that point. We could only live 300 years anyway. So... <laughs> So, yes, it's most likely we will destroy ourselves before the sun has a chance to destroy us. Yeah, Drake was, 
Well, Drake was actually quite optimistic. I think he gave a much longer lifespan, potential lifespan for life, than we are willing to give today. <laughs> So, so the quarter to a half times the radius of the Mercury's orbit, that is the range of the habitable zone. It's very small, so Mercury would be about here. So for a habitable zone around a small star like that, you'd have to be much closer to the star than Mercury is today around our Sun. So that's not the, that's the distance to the Mercury, that's, not the radius of Mercury. Well, the, the radius to Mercury and the distance to Mercury are essentially the same thing from the star. It's the, radi it's the radius of the orbit. Mercury wouldn't fit in that orbit. So if, yes, if the sun was a star like this, Mercury would be far outside the habitable zone. It would be extremely cold on Mercury. It wouldn't right. fit in that zone. And it would not be inside that zone. That's correct. So we happen to be in the right place. And Mars would fit in there? And Mars would be just inside the outside region of that. So Mars is actually still within that, what we would consider the habitable zone. The reason why we're not finding life on Mars, and there may not be any life on Mars, is because um, the planet is too small and it was not able to hang on to its atmosphere. And we have Jupiter to blame for that. Gotta blame it on somebody. <laughs> it turns out Jupiter may have aided in the ability for Earth to have life, but at the same time, it made it impossible for Mars to have life. So, some good things about Jupiter and some bad things. 